Um, Dr. Kabreyeb is the Associate Dean um, for Global Engagement in the College of Agriculture and Environmental Science at uh, UC Davis and Director of their World Food Center. Um, he's very widely published and well known for his work in the area of uh, environmental science and sustainability, particular methane mitigation. Uh, he just co chaired the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization's um, expert panel on mitigating methane emissions from livestock and rice. Um, that uh, blue ribbon panel just reported uh, a couple of weeks ago. Um, he is, um, uh, has also been a contributor to the International uh, Panel on Climate Change um, report as well. He's a very prolific researcher uh, and a true leader in this area. Uh, I'm also pleased to say that he has a Guelph connection. He spent time here as a postdoctoral research associate uh, in the mid-1990s, um, and we're very pleased to be able to welcome him back to speak to us today about the role of livestock um, in reducing methane emissions. Uh, so with that, please join me in welcoming Dr. Hermes Cabrera. Okay, well, uh, th thank you very much for the introduction, Stephen, and uh, thank you for inviting me to, to come here. It's nice to see that a lot of people, some, some of whom I have, have known for, for, for a while. It's nice to be back to Guelph, although I hardly remember it now because uh, it's really expanded from, from what I remember about you know, 15 years ago or so. And I'm also I'm glad that I have this opportunity to talk about one of my favorite um, subjects and uh, talking about agriculture, what's going on with, with agriculture, particularly in, in the environmental sciences. Um, so today, the question is, you know, when we're trying to transition to a net zero uh, situation with, uh, with agriculture, so what's the role of livestock? Can we achieve it? Um, can, can livestock industry achieve net zero? So that's what we're trying to, to talk about and see where that, that, that will take us. So, I'd like to start with kind of the, the big picture. So looking at the environmental impact uh, around the world, you probably have seen this idea of planetary boundaries. Uh, so this is basically in different uh, spheres of uh, environment, we have a, a boundary. And in this case, the green zone is the, what we call the safe operating zone. So we need to be in this zone in order for the, for the Earth to be um, to be viable or the Earth system uh, works the way it has been uh, for the benefit of um, most life forms on, on Earth. So this is, the idea is based on the Earth uh, in the Holocene area, or in the, the Holocene era where you have a lot of uh, biodiversity, um, the, the Earth system was actually working quite well for, uh, for, for, for most life forms and we have the, one of the, the, the biggest biodiversity you had in, in, in different uh, eras. So compared to that, where are we? And as you can see in a, a number of different spheres, we are over the, the planetary boundary. And this is true in climate change, so carbon dioxide concentrations. Um, we are now well over 400 parts per million, it used to be about 300, 350 parts per million. And uh, novel entities that are pesticides and herbicides and all that that's coming to the environment is also more than, than we need. Um, we are okay with the, the, uh, 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 this, the uh, uh, ocean and with um, uh, atmospheric aerosol loading. We are, we are okay so far. But one of the biggest thing is the biogeochem biogeochemical flows. Nitrogen and phosphorus in particular, we are way over the limit. Uh, and similarly, the biosphere integrity, that is the biodiversity, the, uh, the, the number of uh, different species around the world. This is now termed the, the, the sixth uh, extinction. Um, and, and also the, basically how the biomes work within the, within the Earth system. All of that, we are exceeding the limit. So six out of nine, we are exceeding the, the planetary boundaries. So the, but we can't really, I can't talk about all of this today. So we're going to be focusing on one aspect, which is the, the climate change. Um, so if you want, we can talk about it uh, another time, but the, the climate change is the one that I'm going to be focusing on and how 
can we reduce that impact? How, how can we get back to that green zone? Um, so th this is uh, from IPCC, a very recent report in, in, in IPCC where it shows that what do we need to do in order to get to the situation where the, 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 there's no climate impact or we, we get back to the, to the place where the Earth system will function properly. Um, as you can see, it's uh, basically this, this is where we are right now. And what needs to happen is a very dramatic de decrease in, in emissions from the different sectors of the economy. So it's not just from agriculture, but from energy, from transportation, from different sect sectors, we have to get to this, uh, to this level and, and be able to, to, to reduce emissions uh, quite quickly. So now let's focus our attention on, on the greenhouse gases. Right? So the, from climate change, for, for climate change, the most important ones are greenhouse gases, methane, nitrous oxide, and, and, and carbon dioxide. And I want to put it into the context of the wider context um, so if you look at the globally, so the biggest source of emissions, the greenhouse gas emissions, is the energy sector. So about almost three quarters of the emissions coming from the en energy sector. Agriculture in general is about 18 to 20 percent. The food system in general is about 25 percent, 25 to 30 percent. Um, so if you look at the agriculture again, we have livestock and manure, uh, have agricultural soils and um, crop plants and, and rice cultivation, all of that will, will contribute to the, uh, to the emissions. So what are the opportunities? So we have a lot of opportunities in order to be able to, to, to do something about it. And a lot of the light blue ones are related to livestock. So we have a lot of opportunities within the livestock to be able to reduce this, uh, this impact. Um, things like Greenhouse focus uh, genetic selection and, and breeding. So I'm, I know a lot of my, my genetics friends will, 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 will like that. So g genetics will, will s save us all. And <laughs> have, uh, to optimize animal diets. Um, th this is particularly in low income countries where we have most of the animals. This would be one of the ways in which we are able to reduce emissions as well. Or at least emissions per unit of uh, production. Um, again, improving uh, nutrition, digestibility, and all that will also help reduce emissions. Um, uh, to trying to expand some of the technologies that, that, that we have uh, around the world. And some of the things that, some of the things that I will be talking about a lot would be the use of feed additives, particularly anti-methanogenic feed additives, how we can use those to reduce emissions. So we have a lot of opportunity to, 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 to do that. So let's now focus in into the, one of the main greenhouse gases from livestock, which is methane. Now, if you look at where does methane come from, uh, about a third, just over a third, is from livestock. We have oil and gas production, about 30% or so, maybe it's a little bit higher, uh, landfills, uh, abundant coal mines, and rice cultivation would be, uh, would be the adverse, but about 35% from livestock. And then if you further break it down, you'll see that um, uh, we have beef, beef cattle, dairy, and, and, and pork, but the way the methane is being emitted is a bit different from those species. In beef cattle, almost all of it is enteric, coming from the, uh, the mouth and uh, nostrils, while in dairy, it's kind of uh, half and half, or a, a little bit more from enteric, but uh, we have quite a bit from manure as well, because the way that the manure is managed in dairy systems, you have more emissions coming in uh, f f from the manure, f from manure, and it also depends where it is. You know, in more tropical areas, more uh, warmer areas, you have more emissions coming from the manure. Or in the colder climes, where the manure would be frozen for um, four or five months of the year, you have less emissions coming from that as well. And swine production, the same thing. Uh, quite a bit of it is coming from the uh, manure. So. Because of this uh, uh, focus on this, there, there's been a lot of commitments that have been made uh, around the world. For example, in the United States, uh, uh, the trade industry, particularly the, uh, uh, the U.S. Roundtable for Sustainable Beef, has, uh, has come up with a commitment to, to become climate neutral by 2040. The, uh, the dairy industry has come up with commitments to become uh, greenhouse gas neutral by 2050. And in Canada, as uh, Stephen already mentioned, the DFC targets net zero greenhouse gas by 2050. Uh, actually, uh, 
one of the few organizations that has a very detailed plan on how to achieve that is, is, is DFC. Unfortunately, I can't talk too much about it because I'm under NDA, but hopefully all that plan will, uh, will be revealed. And private industry also, a lot of private industry have made commitments. Um, I'm sure you know all, uh, all of these uh, organizations, they, they have done, uh, they, they, they have publicly stated that they want to get in, into a net zero situation like uh, Nestle, 20% by 2025 and, and Danone. Uh, they're now working with EDF to try to get that 50% commitment by 2030. So whether it's achievable or not, it's a different question, but at least there is a lot of push to try to get those multinational companies to become carbon neutral. So what, what is, what, what, when we talk about carbon neutral or climate neutrality, what do we mean? So if you look at the IPCC definitions, it basically means that there is no net effect on, on the climate system. So the, the anthropogenic activities will have no net effect on the climate system. Or you can also look, look in terms of the radiative forcing. So the, the, the amount of um, um, temperature increases that will happen because of the uh, release of those uh, gases. And methane and nitrous oxide will have a different radiative force compared to carbon dioxide. So you have to put it in some sort of metrics to make sure that, that there's some sort of uh, equivalency there. So when you say greenhouse gas neutral commitments, we're talking about a symmetric weight greenhouse gas emissions that are associated with a certain uh, production system. And how you weigh it is a big contention. So I'm not really going to go into it, but you can have uh, weighing depending on 100 year or 20 years or also on the how long the gas lives in the atmosphere. So that's different ways in which you, you want to account. But in general, um, according to the Paris Agreement, then you have to do it on a 100 year basis. It doesn't make sense for methane because it only lives in the atmosphere for 12 years, but that's, that, that's, that's what the agreement is right now. And then we have this uh, methane reduction targets uh, at a global level and at a regional level. At a global level, we have this uh, global methane um, pledge that is put together by uh, the United States and European Union uh, a couple of years ago to, to try to get methane emissions re reduction by 30% by 2030 and from 2020 levels. And that's very soon a lot of other countries joined and now in the last year's meeting in, in Egypt, there was 150 countries have signed up to this, uh, to, to this pledge, including Canada. So what it means is that if every country that has done this pledge actually did it, then you will save about 0.2 degrees centigrade warming by 2050. This is quite significant because right now we are 0 0.1, 0 0.2 uh, centigrade above. So if you're going to stay under 1.5, if you do this, this is quite a, a significant reduction in, in, in emissions. Um, regionally, there are a number of others uh, also. In California, we have this uh, reduction. We have to achieve 40% reduction by uh, 2030, so it's only seven years to, to go. And um, the projection right now is we'll achieve probably half of it. So there will be a 20% reduction the way we're going, but that does not include some of the technologies that are already out there, but we're not, we're not using them right now. Um, I'll, I'll talk about it uh, uh, in a little bit, but if we use those technologies, we can actually get a 40 to 50% reduction by, uh, by 2030. And there are a number of other countries, like Denmark, for example, wants to achieve about 50% reduction. Um, New Zealand is one of the countries that uh, are trying th or thinking about carbon tax to, 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 to significantly reduce their emissions as well. Um, some of it is uh, mandated, like in California, and some of it is uh, basically wishful thinking. So we'll see which ones will, uh, will actually achieve what they want to do. Um, so what, must, what needs to happen? If we're going to get to this neutrality or we get zero uh, methane emissions, what needs to happen? So we, we did some sort of uh, scenario analysis. And we, we played around a little bit with the numbers. Uh, if you get a 30% reduction by 2030, which is quite achievable, th uh, then you can get to that. So you will be able to bend the curve a little bit by, by 2030, but you're not going to get to a kind of net zero situation. So in, in this case, uh, on the y-axis, we have the, uh, the cumulative emissions. 
And then on, uh, on the uh, right-hand side, we have the estimated warming uh, so compared to 1990. So that estimated warming needs to get to zero to get to a, a net zero kind of situation. So we need to do a little bit more than 30% reduction. So if you do 30% reduction, but then continue 1% a year, that will kind of get us to, to where we want to go. So 30% reduction by 2030, and then continue uh, at one at level of 1%. But if you really wanted to go into uh, a net zero situation for, for methane, then we really need to get up to 50% reduction and then 1% reduction from that. But what you see from these graphs here, so the, uh, I should have said the blue one is for methane, the orange is for uh, nitrous oxide, and the black is the combination of the two. You see that the, the orange or the nitrous oxide is still, is still quite high, high up. So we need to get the nitrous oxide emission reduction as well in order to be able to get the net zero for both methane and nitrous oxide. So here I'm just focusing on methane, but I just want to highlight the nitrous oxide issue is quite important as well. I'm fairly confident the, the methane issue, I think we will have, have a good handle of it, but the nitrous oxide, I'm not so sure. So the next thing that we're gonna be working about, uh, that I think people should be really thinking about, focusing about is nitrous oxide. How do we get reducing nitrous oxide? How, how much nitrogen is we'll be using uh, in our systems? So that will be, I think, the focus once we kind of sorted out the methane issue, the nitrous oxide issue is gonna be um, the next big thing because we really need to, to, to decrease that. And the radiative forcing of nitrous oxide is close to 300 times more than carbon dioxide, uh, while methane is about uh, 30 or so. So how do we get there? Right, so I think this is really the, sort of the, the stuff that I want to spend more time on. How, how do we actually achieve? Is it achievable? Uh, so we put together a paper last year looking at what kind of mitigation strategies we have right now. And the conclusion was that if we use those, all the mitigation uh, stuff that we have right, right now, we were, were able to stay under 1.5 by 2050, uh, sorry, by 2030, but we're not able to do that by 2050. So we need to have more technologies, we need to have some advances in order to be able to stay at uh, that 1.5 degree centigrade increase level by, by 2050. So what are those uh, things, what kind of technologies are we developing, and are they viable or not? Uh, so there's two, two sides of the story in terms of there's the demand side and there's the supply side. So I'm gonna spend most of the time on the supply side, but we have to also address the demand side. In some countries, um, most notably the ones here, uh, you have higher uh, consumption of um, animal source food, particularly um, meat and, uh, and meat products. And the, the idea is that um, a lot of, the, and globally, the processed meat consumption is 90% more than what's optimal. So this is a, a global number. And some countries, are, there's overconsumption going on, but a lot of other countries, um, there's not. So there's actually, the demand is growing because a lot of uh, um, countries, low-income countries, are increasing the production or there's increasing demand going on as well. So there's the demand sort of going down in high-income countries, the demand going up in, in low-income countries. So, so we have to think about the demand side of things, but it's, it's quite hard because it's uh, behavior change and behavior change doesn't come uh, easy. So, that, so that's the, the demand side of uh, the argument. On the supply side, we, we can do a number of things to reduce particularly uh, methane. So there are, these are big categories that we can, uh, came up with, looking at uh, animal and, and feed management, looking at diet formulation, as well as uh, rumen manipulation. I'm not gonna go through all of this because there's quite a lot of stuff to, to, to go through and, and I'll give you some references to anybody who's interested to, uh, to, to have a look at that. But I, I like to discuss at least some of them. And the way to look at it is that you can achieve this in two ways. One is based on the product. So per unit of product, for unit of per, per, per kilogram of milk or per kilogram of meat, we can reduce methane emissions. So that's product-based reductions. And then we have absolute reductions. So the absolute amount of methane that uh, you can reduce as well. So on the product-based uh, reductions, there are 
things that you can do in terms of increasing the, the, the feeding level or improving the, the nutritional quality of, of the feed and, and things like that. While in the absolute reductions, there are a number of things that I will uh, go into detail. So I'll talk about the production-based reductions first, and then we go to the, uh, the absolute reductions. So in the, in the product-based uh, reductions, um, for some of you this might be quite fam familiar. For a long time, up to about 1950s or so, the amount of uh, milk produced, so this is the average yield of uh, milk kilogram per cow per year, was stable. And then something happened around 1950s where we, uh, we started to realize about the nutrient requirements of dairy cattle and uh, artificial insemination uh, coming in here. So the genetics and nutrition and management, all of that, we, now we have a sort of an exponential increase in milk production per cow per year. Uh, right now, we are about 10,000 kilograms per, per, per cow per year. And by 2050, it is conceivable that we'll get to 15,000 kilograms per year on, on average. And there's, there's a, in some, some cases, a paper that, that estimated that we could go as high as 25,000 uh, kilograms per, per cow per year. So that might be quite a, uh, I think, a, uh, on, on the high end of, of things. I don't think we can get to 25,000. but. Uh, 15,000 is, is achievable. I mean, a lot of cows uh, right now, you can see production 45, 50 kilograms per, um, per day is uh, pretty common. Uh, so we'll, we'll see greater feed efficiency uh, happening, um, which means that we will have lower greenhouse gas emissions per kilogram or per liter of milk that uh, produced. And we more likely gonna see larger cows uh, we're going to see an increased maintenance requirement um, for the cows. We, we've done this analysis over the last 40, 50 years, and what, you, what we've seen is that the maintenance requirement has increased, but the efficiency has, in, has outpaced the maintenance requirement. So the overall efficiency of converting feed into milk has, has increased quite a bit. And you can see that in this graph also. Um, on the x-axis here is the multiple of maintenance, how much, uh, how much have been fed, and then on the y-axis we have how much of that energy is being captured into, uh, into milk. So we have the, the maintenance energy requirement here, about, about so one, so that basically means they stay, they stay alive. That's, that, that's what I want to be, just you know, ha having enough to, to maintain yourself, and then as you increase it, you, more and more of that energy is being captured. But it's not infinite. You know, at some point, it will be uh, uh, level enough. So what is happening is that you increase milk with the same body weight, or you, you decrease body weight with uh, with the same milk as well. So the idea is to dilute the maintenance requirement. As the maintenance requirement sort of increases, and if you have more feed uh, go going in, uh, then you have more of that energy being captured in milk, so that you produce more milk uh, for for less amount of. Uh, uh, inputs. And, and what, it, what it does when it comes to greenhouse gas emissions is that you become much more efficient per unit of milk that, that, that you're producing. Uh, here, for example, you see that on the x-axis they have milk yield or, or meat uh, in, in this case, and the methane emissions intensity, which is the kilogram of carbon dioxide equivalent per kilogram of that uh, product. And here what you, what you see is that if you're not producing milk at uh, at least uh, 2,000, 3,000 ki kilograms per year, the amount of emissions per unit of milk is quite high. It's about eight uh, kilograms of CO2 equivalent per, per kilogram of milk, while if you're producing more, around 10,000, know, as, as you increase the amount of milk here, then you're reducing the amount of emissions per kilogram of milk produced. The same thing happening with the, the uh, meat production as well. So I'll give you an example um, that we did recently in, in California. So this is for the California dairy industry. And we compared what happened in the 1960s to 2014. So the red bars are in 19, uh, 1964 and the uh, blue bars in 2014. And on the x-axis we have different activities that produce uh, emissions. And then on the y-axis is the, is the greenhouse gas emissions, so the combination of carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide to produce one kilogram of energy-corrected milk. 
And what, what you see here is that for feed production, so this includes uh, particularly nitrous oxide emissions when, when you produce feed, uh, there was quite a big of reduction here, and that's because the improvement in, in inputs and fertilizers and all that, the yield uh, of, the, of the crops have increased so much, so we reduced the amount of um, inputs in there, so we have less amount of emissions coming up per kilogram of milk. Uh, the same thing with farm management, so it's quite a bit of reduction as well. So one of the biggest reductions is in enteric methane, so per kilogram of milk, where we have uh, over 50% reduction in, a, in methane associated with production of one kilogram of milk. With manure, we haven't done as much because we're still using manure lagoons. This is changing now very rapidly in California, but we're still using manure lagoons. And because of that, the amount of methane coming from the manure has not really changed much uh, over the last 50 years. But if you look at the, the in, in total, uh, in the 1960s, we used to spend two kilograms, over two kilograms of uh, carbon dioxide equivalent to produce one kilogram of er uh, energy corrected milk. And in 2014, it was about 1.2, and if I, if I were to do this again, I'll probably go below one kilogram of carbon dioxide equivalent per kilogram of milk. So this is one way to get us a uh, reduction in, in, in emissions, which means that we're gonna be probably needing less animals and we'll have less emissions in, in total as well. So, uh, over the last 50 years, then we've seen about 45% reduction in, in emissions. This is a conservative estimate because we haven't even considered a lot of changes that happen within the dairy industry in, in California. A lot of um, renewable energy that has been introduced, uh, all of that has, has not been captured in this analysis. So I'm hoping that we will do this analysis again soon, uh, so from 2014 to 2024, and we'll see wh where we are at, particularly because of this legislation, we have to reduce emissions. There's a lot of uh, focus on it. And so I, I imagine there will be much less than the 1.2 that, uh, that I showed you earlier. Uh, so this is mostly for California, for high-income uh, high countries. But for low-income countries, the biggest issue is really getting the, the productivity levels up. And, and for that, what we're trying to do now is to produce a Russian formulation software in the languages that people understand. So this is a project supported by the USAID and, and USDA for an agricultural service. Uh, for each of the countries that you see here, uh, we've come up with this Russian formulation software. So people basically say a mobile app. So people will just uh, uh, turn it on. You choose your country. You choose your language. You choose your animal. And then you're able to, to, to do that. So this has now been expanded to uh, 10 African countries and uh, more in, in Southeast Asia. So we've just uh, signed an agreement with the Global Methane Hub. This is uh, an entity that was formed because of the methane, the Global Methane Pledge. And uh, they have put, put in, uh, raised over $100 million to do the, this kind of work. So we'll be working in those uh, 15 countries around the world to come up with this Russian formulation and based on the feed that they have in the country. So that's the most important thing is that we have to make sure that all of this, that this is the available resource they have in the country and it is in the language uh, of that country and trying also to get some more uh, work on the requirement of the, of the animals as well. So one of the things that we, we don't have as much is, is the requirement of indigenous breeds. So a lot of it was, was based on Holsteins or on NRC and, and stuff. So we, we need to do a lot of more research and this, this work that I'm mentioning will also fund work in uh, all of these countries using state-of-the-art technology to try to estimate what is the requirement so that we can match the requirement uh, with, the, uh, with the resources that they, that they have in those countries as well. Um, okay, so this is kind of the, um, the, the product-based ones. And, and now I'm gonna be talking about the absolute reduction. So how do we reduce emissions in absolute terms? So this is a kind of a summary slide where we are in terms of different ways in which we reduce emissions. Um, it, it, it gives you different additives and they are relevant um, effectiveness. Um, it doesn't say anything about how practical it is and where they are at at, at the moment. So I'll, I'll talk about that in a, in a little bit, but this just 
just in a comparison in terms of effectiveness, uh, we have uh, seaweed, particularly those that are based on uh, bromoform, that include bromoform, the effectiveness is pre pretty high. And then you have fatty acids or oils, and then you have uh, other synthetic compounds like 3 nop and then we have a bunch of secondary plant compounds that um, we still don't know exactly how much they, they, they reduce. In some cases, they reduce quite a bit. In some cases, it, it doesn't. Um, so we really need to know a little bit more about, uh, about this. One of the exciting stuff that's happening right now in this area is um, a development of a technology based on, on uh, microbiome analysis and using AI to try to figure out whether when you use one of those things, whether it will be effective or not. So that's really very new territory uh, right now. So you take a sample from the animal, uh, you look at the microbiome, and you have this algorithm, and then that will predict whether giving tannins would, would give you a reduction in emissions for that particular farm. So you have to go, you know, have to do it for, for farm to farm, uh, but because some, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work, it really depends on the microbiome. So this is very much targeted work, and uh, we'll be collecting a lot of data. Um, so hopefully next year we'll have some idea whether this kind of analysis and this kind of technology will help us become more effective in, in reducing emissions. But for now, uh, talking about some of the ones that we know a lot about, uh, one is Using methane inhibitor, uh, the microalgae, particularly Asparagopsis taxiformis, a red seaweed. Uh, this is the work that we've done in uh, Davis with dairy cattle. This is the first ever experiment that was done using Asparagopsis in dairy. And we've seen about 67% reduction in, in emissions. Um, I was very surprised to, to see this level of reduction, but uh, the only issue was that at 1% level here, the feed intake was very low. Like the, there was a, a significant reduction in, in feed intake because the animals basically didn't like it. It's too salty, too different. Uh, the emissions were reduced, but they, the, the feed intake was there. So what, what we learned from that is that it's too high. 1% uh, of feed intake is too high. So we need to bring it down. So the next experiment we've done was uh, in, in beef cattle, and in this case, we, um, we, have, we limited it to 0.5%. So we went half of what we did with the dairy, but we changed the species. So in the dairy, we used Asparagopsis armata. In, in uh, beef, we used Asparagopsis taxiformis. The main difference is the level of bromoform. So the level of bromoform for armata was maybe half as much as the taxiformi. So we were able to, to reduce the total amount, but in increase the, the bromoform concentration uh, as well in this stage. So uh, we had those, those three um, two treatments. Uh, and so the, the control on the x-axis is the uh, weeks. And then on the on y-axis, we have methane production per day. Um, as weeks goes, goes on, the methane uh, went down, and this is the control, the no, no treatment. And this is because of the diet. At the beginning, we have high roughage diet, so more, uh, more emissions. And then towards the end, we have a feedlot diet, high uh, concentrate diet, so low emissions. So this, this works quite well. This is exactly what we expected. And, and then when we add the 0.25%, uh, percent, then we went down uh, quite a bit. And then when we went to 0.5%, then we went even further than that as well. So we were able to see a reduction between 50% to, to 80%, depending on the diet. The more forage-based diet, we have less reduction. More concentrate-based diet, we have the, uh, the, the, the higher reduction. Um, so now this is now big, uh, a product has been uh, put together called Brominata. And they've, they've just got um, a, a certification from the uh, California Department of Food and Agriculture. So now you can legally feed this to animals, but you cannot claim methane reduction. So we'll get, we'll get into that. But you can, yeah, th this is uh, what's called the generally regarded as safe, or a grass certification has been given by the state. Uh, but the federal government has not done it yet. Um, and so we'll, we'll talk about that uh, as well. Uh, so. We, we did this work in dairy, in beef, and then now there's this uh, product coming out of it. Um, but the issue is that you have to feed it on a daily basis, so it may not be, um, 
you can't really do it in, in pasture-based animals. Uh, so the, the second one that I, I want to talk, to talk about is on the, um, another methane inhibitor called bovire. You probably have heard of it, or, or 3 nop It's marketed as bovire in Europe. And you, in the US, it's still 3 nop there, there might be some name change happening in, in the near future, but uh, we still refer to it as 3 nop And this, there's been a lot of work done on this. This is a synthetic compound that inhibits the, the enzymes that is, that's needed for um, methane formation. And uh, over, I don't know now, 40, 50 uh, different uh, studies have been conducted. And earlier this year, we published a paper on a meta-analysis. So we collected all this data, um, and then we put it all together and see what the reduction level was. And on average, what we see is that there is 32.4% reduction. This is in dairy. So all of this data is completely dairy. And so we're doing the same thing for beef right now, but for dairy, there's 32.4% reduction uh, you know, when we look at all of this at the average dose of about 72 milligrams per kilogram of, of dry matter. So at that average dose, you will get 32.4% uh, reduction, but that is uh, influenced by the, <coughs> the concentration that, that you give. So the more 3 NOP you give, the less, uh, so the, the more uh, reduction in emissions, so the less methane um, you have when, when, when you increase the, the, the dose of the uh, 3 NOP. But it is modified by the um, uh, fiber concentration. Uh, so the more fiber is in diet, the less effective it is. So this is also the same thing in, in uh, uh, with seaweed. This is, you know, when you have more the fiber in the diet, it's, it's less effective. And fat also seems to be important in, in this as well. So when you're trying to calculate how much reduction you, you get from feed additive, you really have to consider the diet as well. How much fiber, how much lipid you have, and obviously how much of the material you're putting uh, into it as well. So this is um, pretty well established, and it has been approved in, uh, by European Union. And 40 other countries have approved it. Unfortunately, the US and Canada has not uh, approved it. Um, there is some, some work that, that's going on. The company that p p produced this uh, DSM is now working with uh, Elanco in the US to try to get this uh, through the, the FDA process. Uh, Elanco expects that this will be available or be approved uh, maybe first or second quarter of 2024. So uh, they, are, they are getting ready for it. Hopefully, it will happen at the, in that time frame. Uh, the, the others that I want to talk about is uh, mostly modify the rumen. So the, this one, the, the first, by the seaweed and 3 nop they inhibit the methanogenesis. So they specifically target the, the methanogens. While uh, others, they kind of modify the rumen environment so that they, they kind of compete with hydrogen uh, economy within the rumen. So they take away hydrogen so the, there's not enough hydrogen for the methanogens to convert it into, into methane. One of the ways is to use uh, pl secondary plant compounds such as garlic and citrus extract. We've done this work just before the pandemic and we've seen uh, a reduction of about 20%. But it took a bit of time to get there, so it's really at the end that we saw a significant reduction. And, and so we are going to do this again and to, to see if we can replicate it, but unfortunately uh, pa pa pandemic happened and then uh, the company wanted to change the formulation and all that so maybe in the next year or so we'll, we'll try it again but uh, there is some some evidence that it does it does work um, unfortunately you know sometimes also you know all, all these plant compounds they don't work for example this is a work that we've recently completed um, in a uh, 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 on farm. So this is uh, close to, to uh, Davis, uh, a town called Modesto, where we work with the farmers. We had about 72 animals in this case. And we used uh, an essential oil um, that has, in the literature you've seen that the, the, it, it may reduce or may not reduce a, a emissions. And when we did it, uh, unfortunately, there's not much there. There's no significant difference there. And then, like last week, I saw a, a paper published um, on the same compound and very, very much this is similar. This was done you know, at the different ends of the country and with uh, obviously a different situation. This is in a control situation. We have an on-farm situation. 
and in those cases do, do not work. But as I said before, there could be that some of some it works in some animals, it doesn't work in some animals. It could be because of the microbiome. So I'm very excited to work with this new startup from MIT where they, they're doing this AI um, um, algorithm in, in the microbiome. So maybe that's the way to go forward. Maybe that's, that will tell us if we are actually, if you want to use essential oils, we have to work with a certain microbiome in order to get the reduction that, uh, that we would like to see. The other things that we've been doing is looking at um, uh, tannin-containing compounds. In California, we, pro we like to think that we produce one of the best wines in the world. Uh, but when you produce a lot of grapes, you have a lot of uh, grape pomace that, that, that's left, uh, left over. And uh, one of the uh, big uh, wine companies in California, the Gallo, is not that far from Davis. So we basically went to Gallo and, and got all of this uh, grape pomace and fed it to cows. And one thing I can tell you is that the cows love it. I guess they absolutely love it. So at 10%, even 15% of, of dry matter intake, they will, they will consume it. But we, we're doing the analysis now um, if there was any change in terms of reduction of emissions or milk production. So um, maybe another couple of months before we are able to, to say that. But there's some evidence before, this is in Australia, um, they, they've seen a reduction in emissions. and also an improvement in, in milk production as well. So those in 2014 and, and again in 2020, um, they have done the same work and they've seen a reduction in, in emissions. So if, that, if that's what we see uh, in our case as well, then that would be really a win-win situation. You're using a byproduct and you're, you're saving, not only are you reducing emissions, but you're saving other inputs as well. So you don't have to, to use um, a, a other crops to, uh, to, to feed uh, animals. Um, so as I said, you know, there's a lot of information on this. We, we published this, uh, I think Stephen mentioned earlier, this is from the FAO work that we've done. It's now on the FAO website. There are about 30 or so of those uh, technologies that, uh, that you can see. We also published an um, excerpt of this uh, as the, just for the mitigation part in Journal of Data Science and then for quantification and estimation part in Journal of Animal Science as well. So uh, you, you can have that as well. So now talking about all these tech, tech kind of technologies, how much is being used? Uh, these additives are uh, available. Unfortunately, if you are in the US or Canada, the answer is no. There's, uh, you cannot claim any of this. If you use any of this, although some of them are approved to be fed to animals, you cannot claim a methane reduction. Uh, and that is because it is considered as a, as a drug. Um, F, according to FDA's regulations, something that changed the form or function of the animal is a drug. So it doesn't matter if it, produ if it reduces the, um, uh, or improves milk production. You can use it and you can say it improves milk production, but the same compound, if you, if you say it reduces methane, then it becomes a completely different class of uh, compound and it has to go through a drug route. It takes five to ten years to, to do that, so it really complicates things. So. We've been working with EDF and, and CDFA to try to lobby the, the government to, 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 to change this, uh, this regulation because it doesn't really make sense. And so there is now a bill introduced in, in the Senate. There's a um, bipartisan groups of, of senators that have taken this issue. And what we're trying to do is really get it into uh, so a different uh, category. So we want to change the definition of the, the food additive so that it will include things like uh, that affects the emissions of animals, whether it's enteric or, or methane. So you can also have some compounds, they can put it into the manure to reduce emissions as well. So um, that, that definition should include uh, emissions from, from animals or waste, uh, some uh, foodborne pathogens in food animals, as well as change the animal's microbiome as well. Because when you introduce those kind of food additives, the microbiome is, is, is going to change. Um, so this is the, the, the definition that we would like the FDA to, to adopt. Um, we'll see. We'll see what, what, what would happen. But uh, at least a number of organizations like EDF, uh, non-governmental organizations, are, are pushing for this. Um, hopefully, in the next few months, we may, we may have some uh, resolution to this. Um, almost towards the end now, um, just some of the future directions where things are, are going. One is genetic selection. 
I'm not going to say too much about it because you're going to hear in much more detail from Christine uh, later on. So I, w I will leave it at that, that there's huge potential there um, that will give us a, a long-term solution. You know, we don't have to feed uh, animals on a daily basis. Once you have uh, an animal that's genetically low uh, emitting, then you know, uh, it will be m much more applicable. Um, than, than have to feed uh, on a daily basis. So that's one thing. The other thing I want to spend a little bit more time is this new stuff that, we, that, that we're trying to, to do. This is uh, engineering microbes uh, with, with CRISPR in, in order to reduce methane emissions. So this is really at the, at the forefront of, of, of all of this. So uh, very recently we, uh, we got this project from Tate Audacious, a $70 million project. And it's, um, it's led by uh, UC Davis, UC Berkeley, and UCSF. And it's led by uh, Jennifer uh, Dordner, who uh, won the Nobel Prize for chemistry for um, well, coming up with CRISPR, basically. So, um, so she's leading this, this project. So we're using CRISPR to edit microbes. So as you know, methane is from methanogens, so microbes, really. So. The idea is to edit the microbes so that we don't get methane formed in, in, in the animal. Um, so the, the, way, the way we're thinking about it is that if you are able to come up with those microbes and introduce that at the early ages, then for the, for, the life cycle, for the life of that animal, you will have less methane emissions. And there is some precedent to this. Uh, this is a work that was done not too long ago that shows that when they give this uh, feed additive methane inhibitor at the beginning of life before the rumen is fully developed, and then they stopped it. And for the next, uh, almost a year after that, there is a significant reduction in emissions. So it continued to do that. So effectively, you kind of reprogram the whole rumen so that you don't have to give it on a daily basis. At the beginning of life, you give this, and that's it. For the rest of the life, there will be a, a, a reduction in, uh, in emissions. So. The idea really is to, to do um, sequenced DNA of, of uh, microbiomes. So the, the cool thing about this is we're looking at the, po the whole population. So the gene editing is at the population level. Um, and, and because in the microbiome, you know, every microbe has its own function. So we're trying to understand what's the function of the different microbes within the microbiome. The previously, you need to culture to understand the microbiome, but there's only 1% of, of the microbes in, um, in the rumen that have been cu cultured. So the other 99%, we didn't have access to it until now. But now we can sequence the DNA so we know who is there, we know what the functions are, and what we're trying to do is to try to understand the microbiome of a normal methane-producing animal, and then a microbiome of an animal that does not produce methane. And I showed you earlier with things like ruminate, we, we can effectively eliminate methane. So we, we can understand what does the microbiome look like when there's no methane? What does the stable microbiome look like when there's no methane? So you sequence that and you look at what are the microbes, which ones have been um, upregulated, downregulated, what's the difference, and trying to then maintain that kind of community when you try to, when you edit those, uh, um, those, those genes. So you try to identify which are the, uh, the um, editable uh, uh, microbes, and, and then use CRISPR to try to do that. And, and there are a group of people that are working on the delivery of the tools. So basically, within the room, and you have to take to this, this tool in, into it. And it could be phages, it could be viruses, it could be different ways in which uh, you can orally, you can program it within, within this, uh, uh, like a powder, and ingest the animal at the beginning of life, and basically it will go into the microbiome and edit all this, uh, um, it could be methanogens that they are targeting. And to try to identify that, what we are doing right now is um, sequencing the, 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 the microbiome of those animals. So the animals that are control animals, and then the, and those treated animals, when we try to, to, to see what are differentially expressed between treatment and, and, uh, and control. Uh, this is what we're seeing right now. So this is, this is the control. The blue ones are the control and, and the red ones are the, the, the treatment. And if, if you see that well, how they are expressed, I mean, this is just beautiful to, to, to see how very well you know, they, they are separated out 
uh, in, 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 in the codon here, yeah, the completely different ones, and we were able to identify there are specific genes that are, that are responsible for um, uh, methanogenesis. So now we have target genes. So in the last, this is, this is again, it's not published, it's just raw data that I'm, that, that I'm showing you. And this is now can be, it can target those and be able to, to edit those. And then we can use it in an in vitro system where we introduce this uh, uh, knockout genes and see if, if it works. So if it works in the vitro system, then we take it to the in vivo system. But right now, we're trying to understand the evolution of microbiome throughout the life, the, the life of the animal. So we're taking samples every month and looking at the development of the microbiome for normal animals, for the animals with low methane emissions or zero em emissions, and then animals that have only been given the, the, in the first few months of their life. So we're trying to figure out what does the microbiome look like and how can we get a stable microbiome that does not have uh, uh, methane emission on it. Um, I should have said that there's a, a TED talk on, on this project specifically that done by Jennifer Dortna, so I very much recommend you to uh, listen to that TED talk, it's only seven minutes, and basically she's explaining how we use CRISPR for climate, which is for methane, editing animals, as well as for health. She's also using this uh, with UCSF to, uh, to edit some of the uh, microbiomes for uh, children with asthma. Uh, it looks like there, is <clears throat> there are some genes that are responsible for uh, development of asthma in kids, and so trying to use CRISPR to edit that as well. So Berkeley is doing both. Uh, we, are, we are mostly interested in cows, and UCSF in interested in humans, and, and so I think this is a really nice uh, project to work on those. Um, so uh, in, in conclusion then, uh, I think that uh, feed efficiency will give us a reduction between 0.5 to 0.8% per year. Additives, 2 to 12% per year. And then we have uh, manure management techniques and anaerobic digesters and, and things like that that will, uh, that will help us to go to that, uh, to, 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 to that level. So this is uh, pretty much my, uh, my last slide uh, where we did some sort of scenario analysis in California as well. So this, this graph hides a lot of work be behind it. This is based on a life cycle assessment for, for California dairy. And then we overlaid with uh, a number of technologies that we can use. And um, so this is uh, up to 2030 uh, because of this, the legislation that we have. Uh, this is achievable to go to 1 to 2030, but everything else is speculative. And we can get to this level, we can get to, this is the Paris Agreement. If you're going to stay at 1.5 or of 2, we need to get there. So it's, right now it's very difficult to see how we can get there, uh, but this is just for California, it's not for the world. For California, what we did was, what's the emission in California, what's the proportion of, the, uh, of California emissions of the world, and then we overlaid it in here. So, yeah, so I think we, we're, we are on our way. I think we will be able to get here by 2030. This is 2050 and this is 2100. Um, so I think we need more help to try to get this um, even going steeper than, than, than we're going. So I think we are going in the right direction, but there's, there's a bit more to, to, to go. So all kind of technologies uh, will be will be important. And I just want to say, you know, uh, acknowledge all this work is done by my students and, and postdocs. You know, they are staying up all night to measure me emissions and all, all that. So you know, all, everything I've shown you is a combination of all the work that the students have done. And obviously we have a lot of support from federal government, from state government, from um, farmer organizations, as well as uh, industry. So without all that support, then we will not be able to do any kind of uh, work we've done. And um, I just also ask you to go and, and watch the, my TED talk. I'm trying to get to 2 million views. Right now it's 1.93, so I need a bit more. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Clearly, Amiris is, is a 
truly working on the global stage in a way that uh, many of us can only aspire to, but each of us in our own way in the dairy industry will have a, a small piece to play in where our industry will, will move the needle. Uh, we have time for a few questions. Mike. Right, so, uh, you know, a lot of these technologies that you're talking about are more applicable to the developed world. But as you know, like most of the cows are in the developing world. And yeah. So how do we tackle that and, and how can, you know, Guelph research really start to tackle the developing world? And, you know, which of these technologies would you consider first? Yeah, so I think that, that, that that's the reason why we are having this uh, large project in uh, mostly low-income countries, and particularly in India, where you have about 300 million uh, cows uh, at the moment. And uh, with, with our extensive uh, work that we've done with, uh, uh, with government organizations and, and farmers uh, as well, the issue has been how do you feed those animals to be more productive? So the productivity is, is the biggest issue right now. So like, like I just show, you know, in 50 years in California, we've, we've reduced emissions per kilogram of, of milk by uh, 45%. I think that's where we need to go in a lot of in low income countries as well. So that's why we're developing this rush information software so that people can really use that. There's, there hasn't been a lot of research done on um, breeds, uh, local breeds, and also um, breeds from uh, not local but Im improved breeds as well. So we need to understand what's the requirement, what's the nutritional requirement for those as well. So combination of genetics and nutrition and management, that's where we need to, to, to get to that. And then you know, we don't need as many animals to produce, to, to meet the demand. And that's what happened in, in North America and in Europe. You know, in, 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 in the 40s we used to have uh, 20, 25 million cows in the U.S. Now we have 9 million and we, we meet the, the demand with that. I think that's where we need to go as well. So we don't want in, in low-income countries to increase the number of animals, but we need to be less animals but more productive animals. Yeah, so absolutely. I think um, we, we, we definitely have to think about what are the un unintended consequences, uh, if there are any. Uh, but in terms of the, your first question, uh, it's very relevant for how long can we feed these uh, additives and are they going to be effective for that long? Um, the, the longer one that I've seen for seaweed, for example, we've done 15 weeks, it seems to be stable, seems to be okay. Um, but there needs to be a full lactation trial, and it's happening. There is a full lactation trial happening for seaweed and for 3NOP at the moment. So that, those, those uh, data are not available yet, but they will be available very soon. Um, there is some evidence with 3NOP that it may be, uh, goes a little bit down, I think after four or five months, from about the 30, 35% to down to 25%. But does, does it continue? down to what does it continue down to, we don't know. So that's why we need to do this work. And as I said, there is work in, at multiple universities that has been for full lactation. Uh, we'll do in beef because uh, our dairy is not as, as fancy as, as here. Um, so we, we, we don't have the ability to tie up the dairy for research for a whole year. But in some you know, other places can do that. So that's, that's work that's happening. And I'm looking forward to see that, that data to make sure that the reduction that we see is not just for a few months. It has to be for a full lactation or, or two lactations to make sure that you know that this is this is the actual reduction, and and the unintended consequences. Yes, I mean the same thing you can say with bromoform. There's a paper uh, in Netherlands that uh, fed uh, five ten times more than recommended levels, and they've seen um, some damages to the uh, rumen papillae. Um, so. Yeah, I think we have to make sure that you know, uh, when you give it at the recommended dose for whatever reason of time, 
there's no unintended consequences in the you know, milk quality, the health of the animal, environment, and, and the, the food also for, for people's health as well. So all of that has to be done. Uh, some of it is not ready for prime time yet, but uh, with 300p, is, I feel like that's, that's the one that's been studied the most, uh, but it has to be at, on, on the recommended level. Uh, we have to be the ones that we actually know. Uh, because as you increase the 300p level, you, you decrease more methane, but, but we don't know what the un unintended consequences could be. <coughs> Yeah, so in, in terms of scalability for, uh, for, for, for seaweed, yeah, it's, it's definitely a, a, an issue. Uh, but there are a number of companies around the world right now that feel that they can, uh, they can increase productivity and without, um, sustainably uh, increase the, the, pr the production. And one thing to, to, to think about is that the real reason for as asparagopsis is the bromoform. And now there are at least two companies, one is Ruminate, that's basically producing dromoform in, in a different way, and they don't need the, the production of, of seaweed at all. So it's, it would be much, much cheaper and very easily scalable to produce this and stabilize it and have it in, a, in, in an oil form that you can add into, uh, in, uh, into animal diets. So there's one in, uh, based in California, Bioalga and, and Ruminate. Those are basically bromoform-based kind of thing. The regulatory issue is a, a different issue. I think it will probably get easier um, way, uh, easier pass through the regulatory if you go through seaweed. You know, it's a natural product. There's one of it, uh, one of them is already approved. Um, if you just have a synthetic bromoform and, and bromoform being considered as a potential carcinogen, there's some issues there. So this is, needs to, some needs to be worked out. And, and your second question was, remind me again. Uh, yeah, so, yeah, so the milk composition doesn't seem to be, at least in the, within seaweed, doesn't seem to be uh, that different. Uh, there was a on-farm uh, work done using the seaweed in, in Petaluma. It's actually an, an organic dairy. And they are very, very specific about the taste of, of milk. And they have professional milk tasters and all that. And, uh, at least on that, on that project, they, seem, they don't seem to have any changes in terms of taste or, or, or milk composition as well. So it hasn't uh, at least appreciably changed that, um, uh, as far as I know. Yeah, somebody um, here. Agnes is generously going to be with us for the whole day, so I'm going to conclude the questions at this point um, so we keep some resemblance of schedule. Um, but please join me in thanking Hermes for an inspiring <laughs>